I want to talk to you this morning about how to make a dramatic difference in somebody else's life. A lot of times we come uh, and we approach a church service, we approach a Sunday morning and we think, okay, what's God want to do in my life? And, and that's great. We're going to get to that point. But I want us to look this morning and I want us to talk and unpack how to make a dramatic difference in somebody else's life. Because we've been talking for months about it, what, what it looks like for us to live like Jesus, to lead like Jesus, how we can spend time being with Jesus so that we become more like Jesus for the purpose of the reconciliation of all things. Uh, we've been talking a whole lot about what that looks like. But so often in American church culture, uh, we've gotten into this mindset of, uh, approaching church and thinking about church and uh, coming up with this idea about church being all about us. Our comfort, our preferences, our opinions, our desires, but even deeper than that, it, uh, we can get sideways into thinking that church is just about our place. It's our community. It's our space to be fed. But I want us this morning to shift our thinking, shift our life even, to, be, to begin to think about someone else's life. Uh, because newsflash, it is not about you. Life's not about you. Uh, the same can be said of me. Life's not about me. We, we've, we've somehow put this heat map over scripture, this hermeneutic, which is a, just a, a big $5 theological word of, of how we understand and interpret scripture, we've, we've laid over this idea of scripture that, that it's all about me, my thoughts and my ideas, my, my preferences, my purposes, my season of life, my relationship, and yet I can't square that with scripture because scripture tells us time and time again, it's not about us, it's about God. It's about the glory and the fame of Jesus. And one of the ways that, that we live as followers of Jesus for God's glory and for, for the glory of Jesus and the fame in the name of Jesus is by living for the good of others, by shifting from me to you. It's about helping those who are far from Jesus, who are far from the local church, Find the hope that's only found in Jesus and the community that is found in this local church. It's about helping those people who don't have a relationship with Jesus, who are those spiritual nuns, not the, not the nuns with the, you know, the whole outfit and the get up and, and that sort of thing, but the people who have no relationship with Jesus, no categories for Christianity, and yet are still searching for hope. It's about those people who... Are, are, are far from Jesus, who may have questions about Jesus, who yet haven't put their faith in Jesus. It's about us helping someone to get to that place and become that person that they never thought was possible. And to do that, I want us to look at the very first chapter of the Gospel of John. So if you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you to go ahead and turn over to John chapter 1. And as you're turning there, John is one of those Gospels that when someone comes and approaches me and says, hey, pastor, I just want to know if Jesus has anything to say to me. I just want to know if this whole Christianity thing is something that would be relevant to me. Where can I start? This is where I send people. The Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John is one of the clearest pictures of the Gospel of Jesus, but it's called the Gospel of John, which can be confusing if you're approaching it for the very first time. Because the first couple of stories of the Gospel of John, which is a clear picture of the Gospel of Jesus, is about a guy named John, but not the John who wrote the Gospel of John. It's about a guy named John the Baptist. But only in the first couple of chapters is it about John the Baptist, and then he disappears, and Jesus shows up. Uh, the John in these first couple of chapters is John the Baptist, not John who wrote the Gospel of John. So it's the Gospel of John, but... It's not about that John, it's about a different one, but only at the first two chapters is it about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is not 
the founder of this denominational convention, Baptists, if you've heard of that. John the Baptist was a guy whose job was to get people ready for Jesus, to call people to repent, and to call people and invite people to get right with God. And so in doing the job that God had put him here on earth to do, John the Baptist drew in a crowd. People were listening to John the Baptist. People were respecting him. He had built a following very early on in his ministry. And John had disciples of his own, people he was leading, people he was discipling, people he was baptizing. The name checks out, right? John the Baptist, he was baptizing people. And so in John chapter 1, verse 35, we pick up with the story of John the Baptist. And it goes like this. Then the next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. John is talking with his disciples. He's earned these guys respect, which he's done what it takes to earn respect. He's told the truth even when it's hard. He's kept his word. He's cared about people. But John does something interesting. He takes all of that respect that he's earned, all of that respect that he's done, the hard work of building in his own life, and he redirects it to Jesus in this moment when stars are aligning and everyone's starting to gather around John the Baptist. He says, don't look at me. Don't, don't worry about me. Everybody, behold the Lamb of God, which is a reminder to us that our reputation the respect that we earn in our life has less to do with us and more to do with Jesus. Jesus said it this way. When he was just about to ascend back into heaven, Jesus said it this way in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus says, I want you to take this power from the Holy Spirit, this power that's going to live within you, that as my follower, you now have in your life and in your heart. And I want you to take that and be my witnesses to the truth of who Jesus is. Translation, our call as followers of Jesus, regardless of your training, regardless of your profession, regardless of your education, is to help people find and follow Jesus in your life. That's what we do. And John models this in a two-stage process for us in our text today. The two-step process is very simple. It's this. We collect the respect, earn the respect, build the respect in our life, but not just for our sake, not just for our good, not just so that people like us. We collect the respect and then redirect that respect to Jesus. And here's what I mean. We collect the respect because respect is not demanded. Respect is earned. You know this. You've experienced this in life. It's so hard to receive from somebody. It's hard for anyone to receive from someone they don't respect. You can think about bosses that you've had, coaches, friends, teachers, maybe family members. Respect is key to receiving because if we don't respect someone, it's next to impossible to receive from them. Uh, I think this is practically speaking where, where Christians throughout history have just gotten it wrong because we think, well, if we know things about Jesus, if we have the right Bible verses, if we know the right theology, if we master the right and appropriate answers to the questions that culture is asking, then that's enough for us to be able to speak truth into someone's life. And I can be the poster child of this. Like I got a master's degree and a doctorate in theology. If you don't understand what I'm saying in English, I can bring it to you in Latin or in Greek, maybe in Hebrew if we're in the Old Testament. But here's what I know. You've heard this before. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And just for clarity's sake, that's not in the Bible, but it is true. Jesus said it a little bit differently when he said, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you inform them. No, Jesus didn't say that. Everyone will know you're my disciples by the way that you love each other. And we've said it over and over and over again uh, to, to a point that it's become redundant, to a point that it's become, okay, I get it. How we live matters. 
as Christians, how we live matters. And if our theology doesn't lead to a greater and deeper love of God and other people, we are doing it wrong. Uh, my family, we have a, we have a dog, and uh, we have a miniature golden doodle. And I just put this picture up there, so in case I, I make you mad a little bit later, you'll just remember how cute my dog is and maybe forgive me. But this is our dog, Callie, and uh, she is so cute, but she is so annoying. Uh, our, son, uh, our son, Bauer, asked the other day, uh, Daddy, do we just love Callie because she's cute? And I put my arm around him and I said, yeah, son, <laughs> we just love her because she's cute. If she weren't cute, we wouldn't even love her because she's so annoying. <laughs> but our dog, our dog can't talk. I don't know about your dog. If you hear your dog talk, then let's, you and I talk afterward. We got, we got some things to process. But our dog can't talk. Our dog, our dog can't communicate. She tries to, like she'll put her paw on you and try to say, I want one of those cheese puffs you're eating. Or she'll look at us with those cute, soft puppy eyes begging for food. And whenever we open the refrigerator, she shows up at our feet like, yeah, you got to pay the cheese tax. This is how things roll in this house. And so our dog can't communicate and can't talk and can't speak. But as I observe her behavior, I've got to wonder sometimes if God not allowing our pets to speak was to teach us that love and unbiased affection are demonstrated by actions, not words. There are people right now in your life who have no interest in reading the Bible. There are people in your life right now who aren't even considering, you know what, should I read the Bible? They're not even thinking about that or asking that question. But they're reading the story of your life does your life, do your actions look like Jesus? I'm not talking about morality here. I'm not talking about making moral choices. I'm talking about charity and love and compassion. Please don't get confused into thinking I'm asking you just to be nice to people. We tend to think being nice and being kind are the same thing. I'm not saying be nice. I'm saying we ought to be kind people. Because there's a difference between being nice and being kind. Being nice means we don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. We don't want to say anything that goes against something that they think or they believe or some way that they're living. Being kind, on the other hand, says, I care enough to you, about you to speak in loving candor to you, in genuine care. And we could probably do a whole message on this and unpack for hours and hours what this looks like in our life. But the point is, Jesus, through John the Baptist in the Gospel of John, is inviting us to collect respect to the point that people may not be sure what they think about Jesus. But when they think about you, they see that there's something so compelling, so different about your life, so different about the way that you spend your money, so different about the way that that we live, the way that we navigate relationships, the way that we navigate political seasons, hello, the way that we carry our emotions uh, to the point that people respect us and want to know what is so different about your life that is so compelling and so almost irresistible that I got to know what's going on. It's just so irresistible that they may not be sure they want to follow Jesus. They got to figure out what's going on in your life that's caused all of the change. But again, it's not about them collecting the respect so that they like you, which are hard words for me to say as a recovering people pleaser. But it's not about people liking you. Jesus said it on the, in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine before others so that when they see your good works, when you're collecting respect, they give glory to God who is in heaven. And so we gotta redirect that respect. But oftentimes, when it comes to building and collecting respect, we get stuck, don't we? I do. We get stuck into thinking, well, I don't have enough respect because I got too many problems. If they only knew where I'd been, if they'd only knew some of the choices that I've made, if they've only 
If they only knew some of the problems that I carry every single week, if they only knew where I'd been and the problems that I struggle with, they wouldn't respect me at all. Which, can I just be vulnerable for a minute? Can I be transparent? This is what I carry every Sunday morning when I step onto the platform. Every single week as your pastor, I am not perfect. There are times that I lose my temper. There are times that I get too easily frustrated. There are times where I'm way too easily offended. There are moments when I get embarrassed. Uh, there, There are things that I'm insecure about. Can I just let you in on a little secret? I am not perfect. Don't act so surprised. (laughs) I'm not perfect. And you're not perfect. Uh, Look look at your neighbor right now and say, I'm not perfect. And then everybody else, look back at them and say, I know. (laughs) And that's okay. But we get so sideways, don't we? Pretending we're perfect. Pretending we're all put together. Pretending we've got it all figured out when in reality, we don't. And when we pretend we're perfect, we will never earn respect. We'll never be able to collect that respect that God calls us to. Here's the reality, here's the truth. You and I will, nev- will earn more respect You'll earn more respect admitting you're not perfect than pretending you are. Friends, that's why at Mountain View, we have such a high value. We we place such a high value on authenticity with self that you don't have to pretend like you're perfect. You don't have to act like you got it all together. You, You don't have to pretend like you've got it all figured out like, oh, I put my trust in Jesus and everything is fine right now. No, people, the truth is, people will learn more from you, will feel more connected to you, will respect you more in your pain and your failures and your shortcomings than they ever will from your successes. That's the truth. But please don't misunderstand me saying this morning that you should just toss it all out the window. No, Jesus has changed our life. Jesus has made a difference in my life, and so there's progress I'm not perfect, but I am in process. So my question for you is, where do you have respect? Where do you have respect already in your life that you can begin to redirect and leverage for the glory and the glory of God and the good of others? Where do you need to earn respect? Where do you need to begin to mend relationships? Where do you need to begin to live and lead like Jesus so that you can earn the respect that God has called you to earn and collect so that you can redirect that respect to Jesus? The story goes on. John the Baptist is not done. The story is just beginning in John chapter one. And goes on, the two disciples heard John the Baptist say this, say what? Behold the Lamb of God. Hey, look to Jesus. Here he comes. Two disciples heard John the Baptist say this, and they followed Jesus. Verse 38, Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Now, this is an interesting uh, dialogue here between Jesus and these disciples of John the Baptist. But Jesus essentially says, what are you looking for? What do you want? At the very beginning of the story, as Jesus first asks the question, he's not asking the question, what's your problem? What are you doing? No, he says, what are you looking for? Now, what's interesting, this is at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. He says, what are you looking for? At the very end of Jesus' ministry, at the end of Jesus' life, when he dies on the cross, he's risen from the dead. The first person to find Jesus alive at the tomb, uh, to find the tomb, the stone rolled away. She's there weeping. She comes up to Jesus, and Jesus says to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? 
Now, can I, be, can I nerd out for a minute? Can I geek out for a minute? Uh, I'm like, I'm a total nerd when it comes to studying this kind of thing and a, a bit of a dork. But the original Greek, in the original Greek, the, these two questions, what are you looking for and who are you looking for? In the original Greek, there's only one letter difference between these two questions. Uh, it's the Greek word teen and tina. These two questions, what are you looking for and who are you looking for, bookend the gospel and the story of Jesus. And here's what's amazing. What's incredible is what we are all looking for is actually a who we're all looking for. Because we're all looking for joy and peace and acceptance and significance and purpose and meaning. We are all looking for that in our life and in the world, and we're looking for a bunch of what's that the world is pushing our way and almost pushing down our throat at times, but we're constantly disappointed because the what that we're looking for is actually a who. Jesus in this text asks a profoundly simple question. What are you looking for? He doesn't start with a sermon. Jesus doesn't start with an accusation. What's wrong with you? Here's all the ways you guys are screwing it up. Here's all the ways that you've already messed it up, and here I am to clean it up. No, Jesus doesn't start with any of that at all. And if you look through the pages of Scripture, if you read through this narrative about Jesus, this is actually a pattern in Jesus' life. He meets a tax collector. He meets this man named Zacchaeus. A wee little man was he. And when he meets Zacchaeus, Jesus never explains the exploitation that Zacchaeus was a part of. Jesus never walks Zacchaeus through this criminal network of traitorous tax collecting. No, he just says, come on, you're going to have lunch with me today. Look at the story of the woman at the well. A story where Jesus doesn't present a white paper on why adultery is wrong. No, he just says, come and follow me. He could have. He could have done that. It would have been true. It would have been right. It would have been accurate for Jesus to say, hey, you're, you're a horrible man, robbing people blind. Hey, you're a woman who's been married multiple times and you're living with a guy that's not even your spouse? You kidding me? But that's not where Jesus started. No, Jesus didn't start with a sermon or an explanation or any of that. What What does Jesus say? Verse 38, Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Can you imagine meeting Jesus, the Messiah? Hey, Jesus, First things first, where, where exactly do you live? Where, where are you staying? And they're not, they're not just trying to figure out an address here. They, they, want to, they want to hang out with Jesus. And so what does Jesus say to them? Verse 39, he said to them, come and you'll see. And so they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. Jesus says, come and see. There's no theological download, no sermon, no come and die, no come and sell everything. Hey, memorize some scripture before you come over to my house. Clean up your life. There was none of that. The invitation wasn't threatening at all. It wasn't come and convert. It wasn't show up and shut up and just listen to what I have to say. It wasn't turn or burn. No, it was simple, come and see. And so they went to where Jesus was staying And they spent the day with him. It was about 4 p.m. This 10th hour was about 4 p.m. in the afternoon. It was about that time that you would finish work for the day and that you would head home and begin to prepare your family's meal and have family time together before the sun went down. And we see a picture of Jesus treating them just like family. This isn't what rabbis would normally do. But remember, Jesus never came to emphasize a new religion. He came to invite people into a new relationship. We aren't inviting people into a religion. We're inviting people to come and see if a relationship with Jesus is what they have been looking for and longing for. 
And this relationship with Jesus changes everything. Watch this in verse 40. After they've hung out with Jesus, verse 41 of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The first thing that Andrew did was went and found his brother Simon and told him, We've, we found the Messiah. Andrew gets his brother Simon and says, you've got to check this out. You've got to come and see for yourself. And Simon shows up in front of Jesus and Jesus says to him, this is hilarious. I know who you are. You're, you're Simon, the son of John. I already know who you are, but I got something different for you. I know who you're going to become. And in that moment, Jesus just met him and already changed his name. He says, I got plans for you. I'm gonna turn you into something that you could hardly even believe. And in that moment, he changes Simon's name. I'm not gonna call you Simon. I'm gonna call you Cephas, which in Aramaic is is Aramaic for Peter. Peter is Greek for the rock. Jesus looks at Simon and says, I'm going to call you the rock. I'm going to make you solid. I'm going to make you stable. I'm going to make you strong because I got plans to work in you and through you. And eventually Jesus would look at Simon and say, you are Peter. You are the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell are not going to be able to stand up against the onslaught that's coming for the local church. You're going to lead my people, Jesus would say. You're going to start this thing that we call the church, and it's going to storm the gates of death with the message of life. Peter became the leader of the early church, the leader of this thing that you and I are still a part of a couple of thousand years later. Just think about this with me for a second. Think about the implications of this invitation for just a minute. How different might things be For us, certainly how different would things be for Peter if Andrew hadn't gone and gotten his brother and said, hey, come and see Jesus. He still would have been Simon. Uh, Simon would have never become the rock. He would have never been part of starting this church movement that has been responsible for millions and billions of people meeting Jesus. And y'all, that's my story too. Uh, I'll never forget sitting in a homeless shelter with Uh, uh, several hundred homeless people as I was asked to bring a message of the gospel and preach to uh, men and women in this homeless shelter. Uh, I was invited by someone who in my middle school and high school years had mentored and discipled me, a man named Dr. Bill Prine. Uh, I'll never forget the time that Dr. Prine just showed up randomly outside of my house. I can still almost see his old, late model, powder blue Ford Astro van sitting outside of our front lawn when he walks up to our front door and says, hey, I'd like to invite you to a Bible study with other middle school and high school boys. And because of that simple invitation for him to invest his life in me, I was able to stand and preach in this homeless shelter in front of several hundred men and women who are without a home and say, because of Bill Prine inviting me to be one of his disciples and mentor me and invest in me, I'm standing before you today preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because of his invitation. You never know what God might do in the life of somebody that he's put in your life. We've talked so much over these last few weeks about how How we live matters. But more than just living our lives, we've got to understand that God is inviting us to take this invitation to bring someone along with you. So who is it in your life? Who? Who's in your life that needs to come to see in Jesus? Who needs to come and see Jesus? What respect do you need to to earn in your life, and then redirect to Jesus. 
We've got to become relentless in doing whatever it takes to reach one more person for Jesus. And it starts with you. You can reach one. And all it takes is a simple invitation to come and see Jesus. You never know what God might do through a simple invitation. Maybe this morning you just need to have some conversations with people so that they can begin to understand that you care for them, not as a project, but as a person. Maybe there are people in your life that they don't know Jesus. And you need to start living in ways that the Bible is really clear so that they can read the pages of your life and begin to understand the life of ministry of Jesus. Maybe it's time for you to extend an invitation to say, hey, come and see for yourself if Jesus is who you've been looking for. And at Mountain View Church, we want to give you some really easy ways to invite people, to bring people with you. Uh, Ways like Fall Fest. Such an easy way for you to say, maybe you've invited them to church before, but such an easy way for you to say, hey, my church is hosting this fun family event. I'd love for you to come along with me. This is why we do series at Mountain View. Hey, my church is doing this series where they're talking about this manifesto of Jesus. I'd love for you to come and come and see. Uh, there are moments and opportunities that we want to essentially roll out the red carpet and make it easy for you to invite someone to come and see Jesus. Can I just be blunt? I have no interest in packing out Mountain View Church. I have great interest in packing out heaven. Did you know that studies have shown that 80% of people who don't go to church say they would probably go to church if someone just invited them. 80%. That's like a B. That's above average. 80% of people who don't go to church said they would go to church if somebody just invited them. You know how many, in that same study, you know how many Christians invite people to come to church with them? 2%. 2%. The odds just like the Hunger Games, are ever in your favor. (laughs) So, can we connect our lives and the lives of other people to the God who loves us more than we could possibly know? Who do you need to invite? Who do you need to redirect to Jesus so that their life, just like your life, can be forever changed? Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that you've invited us to be a part of the work that you're doing. We know that you could accomplish this work of changing lives, of shaping families, of changing the trajectory of lives for generations to come. You could do all of that without us. God, may it never be lost on us that you've invited us to be a part of what you're doing in this world. God, give us the courage and the boldness and the strength to see and find and seek out opportunities to invite someone to come and see you. Jesus, would you in this moment just place someone on our heart that we need to invite? Someone who needs community, someone who needs hope, someone who needs Jesus. God, would you place a name on our heart and then give us the courage to send the text, to make the call, to invite someone to coffee, to take them to lunch, to bring them to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.